be with students who have chosen to come to class. <laughs> That's a, a shift for me. So uh, those of you who I have not gotten the chance to get to know, um, I, uh, I was a pastor here from 2015 till 2020 and um, got moved up to Marietta for a couple of years. And then just this past uh, July, I transitioned out of being in the church to being in the classroom. And so I'm sporting my brand here on my chest this morning. Uh, I'm working at Mount Vernon School just up the road teaching science and this upcoming year teaching uh, world religion class. It's been a blast. Um, Brian, you are lucky to be in a room telling jokes with adults who I feel like give generous laughs and jokes you might see. Even when you're not being funny, you get a generous laugh. Like people participate. You're standing in front of like 20, 14 year olds trying to be funny, and it is a slow death. It's an angel. So I may have you come in and show them what real humor looks like. Uh, so, uh, I'm so glad that this that this thing is still rocking and rolling. Um, when Pat Morgan, so I, I, I've been given a little bit of credit for this thing. It really is all in my mind. Pat Morgan was the uh, the genesis behind this, and um, we started talking about this in fall of 2019, I think, right, Pat? And um, and the only reason I said yes so quickly is because I, I knew he was going to continue asking, and I knew that. I was on my way out from Dunwoody, so like, that's fine. I just got to keep Pat happy for like two months, and then I'll, I'll be on my way. But um, to, to start this and then to have COVID hit and all those things and to still have this many people get me, it's just really a wonderful blessing. So uh, I'm honored to be um, to helping out today and in a couple of weeks. It's, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be with you all. And so what we're talking about um, this week leading up to Phil, I believe this is the sermon for Sunday. Is that right? Is that we, the, the rhythm we're in now? So we're um, we're about a third of the way through uh, Matthew here. Um, and so let's go ahead and pull the scripture up on the screen. Here. How patient do I have to be, Andy? <laughs> do I press that button? Look at that. Okay. So um, there aren't a lot of pictures uh there's not a lot of art depicting this scene but i did find one that i kind of liked um this is uh caravaggio i'll read the uh the scripture here and then um interested to see what what you guys think about the picture this is called in the classroom a visual thinking routine so take a look at the visual and uh, as i read the scripture here um, i'm interested to see any, anything that jumps out at you so starting with verse nine as jesus was walking along he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collection station, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Uh, so any thoughts? I know the picture is kind of small there, but any, any, anything jump out at anybody? Anything you like or find interesting there? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this is this would be if, if if the disciples if Jesus had happened during Shakespeare's time. I, yeah, that's right. uh, I think what I what I like most about this is if you notice everybody is pointing at somebody else, right? So how often is that the truth when Jesus comes calling and the group is like, oh no no, he's he, mm, I think he's talking to you. I think he wants you to uh, to go and do something, right? So that's kind of what I like about this uh, picture here is kind of the um, I imagine kind of the reluctance of everybody to leave this job that they are in. And you, you see that it's a lot of, uh, a lot of people are pointing to this one kid who's got his head down, who I think he's probably was already prepared. I think he kind of knew Jesus was coming. He's just like, ah, oh, man. And so, um, so this is how our story begins. Jesus is walking along, comes to the tax collector station and everybody points at Matthew and says, I think he's talking to you. So this is the way I'm gonna um, kind of break the story down We'll spend a few minutes in, in each of these three sections here. 
So the first couple of verses are kind of setting the scene. We're introducing our characters. We're getting to know Matthew. Matthew is called. Matthew responds. And then we have a house party, right? We have all of these tax collectors and sinners that come to the house in the evening to have a meal with Jesus. Then we have this brief uh, moment here in verse 11 that kind of shifts things from a happy moment to a, maybe a little bit more of a uh, cautionary uh, tale. And the Pharisees show up. And they crash the party and they act like jerks, right? They ask a question that really they're not very curious to know the answer to. They're just trying to be mean. And then we close out with Jesus's response, uh, which as always, when he's in, engaging with the Pharisees, uh, shows you just how wise and I think funny Jesus can be. Um, so this is how the story kind of breaks down. So starting with our first bit here, read this part again. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collection station, and he said to him, follow me. He got up and followed him. As he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with Jesus and his disciples. <clears throat> so if we could make this, these uh, sections here a little bit interactive, I think that would be a little bit more fun. Um, so my first question is, anybody know where we are? We're kind of starting... As they say in media res, we're in the middle of things, right? Jesus is walking along. Anybody know where we are? Galilee, Capernaum. Yeah, this is Capernaum, okay? So this is a picture, kind of a depiction of what Capernaum would have looked like um, back in Jesus's time. Capernaum was just kind of at the top of the Sea of Galilee, next to Gennesaret, which is another, uh, this is kind of a, a, Gennesaret was a scene where you may remember the, um, the man coming out of the tombs, right? Running out of the tombs, and he's been kind of locked away and chained away. So this is the village right next door. And, and chapter 9 begins, it says, Jesus came back to his hometown. So Jesus' hometown is not Nazareth, it's not Bethlehem, it's Capernaum. This is where Jesus probably grew up, lived his life, practiced his trade, got to know people, all that sort of stuff. So we are in Capernaum. Anybody have a guess about how many people were living in Capernaum? At this time, so we can get get a, get a sense of how big of a town we're talking about. What are we thinking? Five hundred thousand, pretty much in that neighborhood, right? About fifteen hundred people. So you can think about if you want to try and imagine, okay, what sort of community is Jesus part of here? Think about basically if Dunwoody UMC, if everybody who was a member of Dunwoody UMC actually came to Dunwoody UMC. And that is kind of, you can imagine, that is what it looks like. So think about Easter Sunday. Think about Christmas Eve. This is the number of people that we're talking about. This is, these are the people, the small town that Jesus has grown up with, and the people that Jesus has gotten to know. So everybody knows Jesus. Jesus knows everybody. So then who is Matthew? He's the tax collector, right? And as we all know from Sunday school and from reading the Bible on our own, the tax collectors are the bad guys. Right, tax collectors and the Pharisees and the sinners, these are all the, the kind of characters that get painted as the villains. Have things changed much for tax collectors in the last two years? Not really, right? Uh, we, we just got our refund last week. I was cursing the IRS for a couple of months and we just got a refund, thankfully, because our fridge broke, so it came at the right time. We all, who has plan? You guys always have plans for your tax refund. Does anybody ever get to use your tax refund for what you're you planning to use your tax refund for? No. We, yeah, what's a tax refund? Um, my father-in-law thinks that nobody should get a tax refund because he said, that means you gave the government more money than you should have, and you should have kept it and invested it. And I said, if I'd kept it and invested it, there would not have been any money at all to, to have to come back to me. So I am actually one of those who's very happy to say, here, you, you, will, you will take better care of this than I probably will. Just give it back to me at some point. So anyway, um, so Matthew's the tax collector. And you got to remember that he was not a tax collector for the people of Israel, right? It's not like our IRS agents who are collecting money from us to then put back into the American system, right? To put things back into our communities. They are collecting, who was, who was Matthew collecting money for? He was collecting money for the Romans. He was collecting money for the occupiers. And the only way in those days for a tax collector to make any money, they were not there on salary. The only way to make any money was to overtax your people and then keep the rest, right? So Matthew is a part of this group that, now we don't know if Matthew was a good tax collector, just like, just like in any kind of trade, right? There are, there are good ones and bad ones. 
Maybe Matthew was a great tax collector. Maybe he only ever taxed what was supposed to be taxed. Maybe he was very apologetic. And said, Look, guys, I know not, I know you don't want to do this, but this is this is the system we're in. This is the way things are. Let's just make this go easy. And maybe he was a good. Maybe he was not a good one. Maybe he was somebody who was known to have kind of been overcharging so that he could pad his wallets and build a bigger house. But that is how Matthew made his living: was taxing his brothers and sisters in his community to pay. The foreign government. The last question then, whose house are we at? So we, we, we start, we're in the tax collector's booth, Matthew is called, and, and then all of a sudden, fast forward a few hours, we are at the house having dinner. Whose house are we at? Your Matthew. Peter's mother, Matthew. Matthew. Any other guesses? So most of the translations don't say. In the Greek, it just says in the house. The translations that do offer a, a I guess pretty much all of them say Matthew's house, right? Because that might seem like a natural thing. You call Matthew and then you go back to the tax collector's house. Personally, I'm trying to imagine how this scenario would go, you know, like in our Dunwoody UMC community. And if we're in Jesus's hometown and Jesus has gone and gotten somebody and says, hey, I want you to follow me. Where do you think Jesus is going? I think Jesus is going to Jesus's house. Right. I mean, anytime I've ever invited somebody to come to dinner, I've never said, let's go to your house for dinner and have you cook for me. Anytime you invite somebody to go somewhere, it's usually back to your house, right, to show hospitality. So in my mind, I read this as Jesus has gone and found a tax collector and said, I'm cooking dinner tonight. Come back to my house. Follow me to my house. We're going to have a conversation. So I picture Jesus being back at his house. And what did Matthew do before the dinner time reservations? Well, Matthew told a few people, I'm going to Jesus' house. He's cooking dinner. You guys should come. <laughs> so Jesus has prepared a meal for Matthew. And, and maybe Jesus knew that this was going to become a bigger gathering. Maybe Jesus didn't. I don't know. I tend to err on the side of Jesus probably do. But um, so Jesus is having dinner with his tax collector with Matthew. And then all of a sudden, Everybody in the town who you probably would not want to come to your house for dinner has come to your house for dinner, right? Everybody in the town who is a part of some sort of, you know, enemy group or villain group or, you know, scandalous group, the people who are the quote unquote sinners, those who everybody in that community knows, oh, they, um, they did that thing. They did that thing. Or this person's guilty of that. Everybody who you would not really want to be seen with shows up at Jesus' house for dinner, the most notorious group of people you can imagine. So let's move on to part two. Here we go. So this one verse here in the middle, verse 11, when Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So again, the first question, who are our Pharisees? Who are the Pharisees? The lay critics. The lay critics. You're pretty familiar with that, right? Yeah. yeah. Being a late critic. Choir critic, maybe. Yeah, these, these are these are these are basically the uh, yeah, these, these are the church staff. Okay. This is the church staff. These are the these are the pastors, these are the clergy, these are the people in charge of the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, where did they come from? Were they invited? They got word. They heard, right? Again, I think sometimes we kind of, um, for some reason, we start to we, we kind of think, well, these 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 had to be these huge cities, right? And so, but remember, this is this is a small community. You can kind of take maybe one chunk of of Dunwoody, and there's Capernaum, right? You can think about the branches or just some something really small that you can kind of get your hands around. So they heard, right? There's a party going on at Jesus's house, and everybody in the town who nobody should be caught in public with is at Jesus's house. Now, so what would, what would good caring church staff members do when they hear that one of their own has, has thrown a party for all of the town's trash? They're going to go check on it, right? Because they care. <laughs> <laughs> because they want to show up and show some passion. So the Pharisees hear what's going on. 
they hear that all these tax collectors, all these senders, these people who they have probably made a list of and have spread around town, hey, you don't want to be caught with that person because they did this, because they did that, right? They're all gathered at Jesus' house and they think perfect. Because remember, over the, over the last few chapters, if you have paid attention, if you've read this, what, what kind of relationship did Jesus and the Pharisees have? It's not very good, right? It's pretty contentious. But remember, this is Jesus' hometown. So these are, these are probably the people that Jesus grew up with. These were Jesus' teachers. These were Jesus' pastors. These were the people who, when, when Jesus was in need, Jesus went and found these people, and they probably helped them out. And then as Jesus grew and kind of, you know, ministry kind of became sort of Jesus' vocation, well, they, for a minute, the Pharisees probably were Jesus' colleagues, right? These were the ones that Jesus was having conversations with about, well, what do you think it means in this part of the law? What do you think we should say to the people about that part of the law? What did Moses mean when he said this? These were the people that had kind of become his peers in ministry. But then once Jesus really kind of embraced what his calling was, what he was supposed to do, and started doing things a little bit unorthodox, started pushing the boundaries a little bit, now the Pharisees have kind of become his enemies. And unfortunately, in the Methodist church, we kind of know what this is like. We, we uh, as you know, over the last decade or so, we have been going through this really painful process of really kind of having one group of people go to this side, and one group of people go to that side, and we're... We're in the middle of a, a, a difficult part in our united relationship. And so you can kind of imagine what this relationship might have been like, right? The Pharisees stood on one side. We know what is right. We have the truth. Our way is the right way. And Jesus stood on the other side and said, I love that. I think we need to keep a little bit more of an open mind about these tax collectors and sinners, right? I think we need to be spending a little bit more time with the people who have been kicked to the outside. So you have these two groups that have kind of formed, and, and there's, there's this animosity that has been growing. So the Pharisees, Jesus' frenemies, show up. And again, they know each other. They know Jesus. Jesus knows the Pharisees. They're asking the disciples this question. What do you think is the tone of their question? Do you think that they're curious? Like, I, you know, we had never really thought about eating with tax collectors and sinners. Why? Why is Jesus doing that? We'd like to learn. You think that's their tone? What's their tone? Condemning. Condemning, right? Probably very sarcastic. So I put um, I put the Greek up here because I wanted to impress you guys. And then also because I wanted to try and get you to kind of see how the question really breaks down. It's not, it's not, it doesn't translate into the English the way that we read it. It's not why, why is your teacher eating with sinners and tax collectors? The second line here is really kind of the beginning of the question where it says, it looks like Dia. The question really is, for what reason with tax collectors, with sinners, eating is your teacher Jesus. So this question is front loaded with all of the ugly stuff, right? The way they even phrase the question, it's almost like they show up and they go, well, look, look at this. Tax collectors. Sinners, it's like a sinner's convention. Amazing. Now, huh, what reason would Jesus have to be eating with people like that? Because who did they think Jesus, what group did they think Jesus belonged to? That group, right? This whole time, remember, this whole time, the Pharisees, what their work has been, has been to try and destroy Jesus, to try and paint Jesus as a sinner. Remember, he breaks the Sabbath laws. Remember, all these things that Jesus has been doing, all of the great stuff, the preaching, the teaching, the healing, every single time that's happened, the Pharisees have shown up to try and say, that's not God. That's what a sinner does. So they have been, it's kind of like they show up and really their whole plan is, we know he's guilty. We just have to find a charge first, right? How many lawyers? Is that how you guys practice, practice law? <laughs> this is how the Pharisees are practicing the law at this point. They know Jesus is guilty. They just have not figured out yet how to convict him of anything. And you will see by the end of the story that they finally nail it, right? They finally figure out how to do it. That's kind of been their whole plan. We got to find a way to prove that he's guilty. We know he's guilty. We just, we just don't know how to show the people. So they show up with this question to say like, ah, we knew it. See, he's having a party. 
This is the group of people? Of course this is the group of people he's with because Jesus is one of them. Jesus is a sinner just like all of these people. So that's the tone of their question to the disciples. Very sarcastic, very condemnatory. And then we move on to Jesus' response. <laughs> so this is a picture of somebody at the party that night when Jesus gives his response. When Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. So, first of all, why do you think, how do you, how do you think Jesus heard? My guess is the Pharisees were not being very quiet. My guess is the Pharisees were, had a very elevated voice right? Oh, look at this group. What do you think Jesus is doing here? So Jesus hears what's going on. What do you think is the tone of his response? Patient. Okay, patient. Calm. What else do you read there? Ooh, snark. One of my favorite tones of voice. <laughs> Anybody else? How do you think Jesus would have played this? Again, it kind of gets, we, the, 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 oftentimes when we are translating out of the Greek and into the English, some of the steam, some of the bite gets taken out of stuff, right? And, and we're, also, we're also just used to reading this stuff in church. And you're supposed, to, you're supposed to say nice things in church, right? You're supposed to act polite in church. So do you think Jesus was being polite? So again, when you read the original, the way that it kind of gets painted, the way that Jesus is really saying is, well, I mean, those who are clearly in such perfect health, they don't need a doctor. It's all these diseased people. That's the word in the Greek, diseased. It's these diseased people. So I think it's a little bit of snark. I think it's Jesus saying, oh, I, I can play the sarcastic game. I can, I can say what I'm really thinking without saying what I'm really thinking, if that's how you want to go about it. So I think Jesus' response to this is to be clever. I think it's to be clever. I think it's to be a little bit snarky. I think it's to point out, oh, you guys, yeah, well, you guys are obviously, you, you guys are perfect. You got it made. I mean, you're Pharisees after all. You've got all the answers, right? You've got it all figured out. You do everything perfectly. You don't need a pastor. Your pastors yourselves. Who needs the pastor, though? All of these diseased people, right? These people who are sick with sin. So in my mind, the way I see this is Jesus is kind of taking the way that maybe Pharisees have described Jesus' friends in private, and he's just making it public. I've heard how you guys, I've heard how you Pharisees talk about these people. And since you think that they are so sick and ill and unwell and diseased, well then, hey, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be here, right? And then, so he kind of calls them out, right? He's a little bit provocative. And then he says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What, what that actually is, is it's actually, it's not go and learn. It's surely you have already gone and learned. That's how it's written. So again, I think the snark kind of continues. I think this is Jesus is saying, well, I mean, you guys are, you're perfectly healthy. These guys are sick, but surely you, you've already learned that this is the whole of the pastor, right? It's to go and be with the people in need. Because, I mean, you're masters of this, right? You got the long robes and, and, you, and you look the part and, and everybody gets out of your way when you're walking through town, right? Because you guys, you guys have already figured this out, sure. What have they figured out? This is from the Old Testament, obviously. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You guys have figured that out, right? That God's about mercy. That God's about compassion. That God's about forgiveness. Because you, you've been doing this a long time. So, so what do you think Jesus is trying to do here? When, how does that word land with the Pharisees, do you think? If, 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 there are, if there are any Pharisees there, maybe who are kind of like Nicodemus, right? The Pharisees maybe who are 
who are trying to kind of like be open to what Jesus is saying. I wonder if there's a few of them who kind of are like, ah, yeah, that hurts. Yeah, you got me. You got me. But mostly, since obviously the Pharisees continue their campaign against Jesus for the rest of the gospel, most of them are probably stubborn and stuck in their heart and hearts. And this is just more fuel for their fire, right? Because now they've been embarrassed in front of everybody that they had been trying to embarrass their whole lives. Now they're standing there at this party full of tax collectors and sinners, and everybody is laughing at them, right? Surely you figure this out. Go and go and be merciful. Don't worry about sacrifice. So we have this provocative statement. We get this kind of pushback from Jesus. And then we get Jesus' really kind of return to his mission statement. This is where Jesus kind of returns to, why am I here? I haven't come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners. That's the whole point of this, right? It's not to point out those who have done it perfectly and say, yes, that's our model. It's to go and spend time with those who are struggling, those who have been pushed out, those who have been outcast, and to say, God is actually with you. Don't worry. Don't fear. You have not been abandoned or forsaken or forgotten. God is with you. God has thrown a party for you to remind you of who you are. Because those people out there, they really don't think they need God anymore, right? That's the whole idea of being self-righteous. That's kind of what the Pharisees, that, that is, is, I guess, how we would describe uh, someone who has gotten to know God so well that they kind of think, I can do this on my own, really. I mean, I figured, I figured it all out. Don't really need God in my life anymore. But the sinners need God. They think God has abandoned them, that God has left them behind. Why do they think that? Because the Pharisees have told them that their whole life, right? You are a sinner. You are not a part of God's family. So, so this scene, this party, I don't know how it ended. Verse, uh, verse 14, we move on to something totally different. But I kind of imagine, you know, I like to think of it kind of like as a, like a good movie about like a like the like the nineteen eighties when you've got you know all the all the dropout kids like kind of like a Daisy Confused kind of movie if you've seen that right you've got all these dropouts all these people who are breaking the law and weren't paying attention in school and doing all the things that made all the teachers and coaches mad they're all hanging out having a great time and then the coach shows up he's got people like me he's got the teachers with him right. And then the party just goes on. They try to break it up, but the party goes on. Because that's, that's what life with Jesus is, is meant to be. It's meant to be a life where life is lived to the fullest. Where joy and hope and peace and belonging and love continue no matter the obstacles that come and try and, and interfere with that. So this is our story this morning. We've got... It starts, we think this is a call story about Matthew. Really, it's kind of, I think, just Matthew's a stand-in for, I won't say all of us. Depends on what you, how you identify yourself. But I think it's a stand-in story for everybody who has been told that they don't belong. Matthew is the stand-in for all those people who feel like, I just don't belong. I've been told I'm not good enough. I've been told I do things wrong. I've been told to stand on the outside. Matthew is the stand-in for all those people, and Jesus welcomes them all to his house. He throws a party for those people. And the good, well-dressed, well-read teachers of the law show up and try to bust up the party, but Jesus says, no, this party is not for you. If you think you don't need God, well, this is God's party, so go somewhere else. So we got some questions for us to kind of think about as we try and translate this into our own lives. So we'll move to our table discussion here for our last 20, 25 minutes or so. So a few things to kind of work our way from the story into what is life like? How does this tie into our experience of the Christ? How does this tie into our experience of the church, our community, other people? What do you remember about a time when you as an outsider were included by an insider? What did that feel like? And it could be something benign. It could just be like, you know, you showed up at a mixer and you, you were new and you didn't know anybody. And what did it feel like to stand on the outside and have somebody come and grab you and pull you in, right? 
maybe it's something a little bit deeper. Maybe you really felt like you had been pushed out of a community, out of a family. What did it feel like when somebody brought you back in? What do you remember about a time when you, as an insider, included an outsider? It's not an easy thing to do. Because when you're in the inside, it's kind of nice just to stay with other insiders, right? You show up and, and you just you gravitate towards those people that you've always gravitated towards and had conversations with. And that's it's hard to kind of take a step back sometimes and look around and say, who is not, who, who, who clearly does not feel like they're a part of this group? What do you remember about a time when you went and found somebody and brought them in? And then right now in our life, who's outside of who is outside the life of the church? Who is outside the life of one of your communities? Maybe it's at work, maybe it's in your neighborhood. Who is outside the life of your family? What are you doing about that? And then finally, do you consider yourself more in spiritual good health, like the Pharisees, or in need of a doctor? And why do you feel that way? What might Jesus say to you about that? So, Andy, we're just moving to table time.